Information Station, 1370 WOCA. About 10 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Nice looking Thursday. A little bit cooler. Nobody's complaining about that, right? Mm-hmm. So this uh, last week, our Silver Springs, which has long been a, a, a a privately run park uh, became a state park, and you and I became familiar with uh, with Florida's state parks about a year or two years ago, and discovered these beautiful, beautiful resources that we have in our state. And the one thing that I was very, very happy to see, and and I. You know, I wasn't really one of the per- people who went to Silver Springs when it was a tourist attraction. Mm-hmm. You know, because, you know, you see it, then you're done, right? Um, but when it was a, now that it's a state park, we went there. And I was really happy to see, because I was expecting maybe the water was going to look bad, because he heard all these bad reports yeah. about the water. And it really looked good. Now, compare that to what we discovered on Orange Lake, which had gone down. Com- I, I'll say completely, of course, that's not literally true. But just about mm-hmm. completely, right, before it started coming back. Right. Over, over in uh, Rainbow Lakes Estates, we had Lake Bonneville. My goodness, it went from like a, mm-hmm. a lake that was two miles wide to a puddle. Yeah. And I, I don't, haven't been over there in a, about a year, so I don't know if it's made a comeback or not. But, you know, you hear some crazy things going on with the environment. The um, <clears throat> drought and and some of the other conditions have affected the pumpkin crop. We heard that, right, yeah. recently? Yeah. Um, So there's a lot of things we need to be paying attention to. Some of them, maybe we as individuals could change our behaviors and maybe make a a difference if enough of us took care of that. I remember when I was a kid in New York, there was a cartoon that they used to promote uh, not littering. Mm -hmm. And it showed uh, like a little line drawing of a kid throwing a piece of paper on the ground. It says, what's one little piece of trash? Nothing. But put enough of them together and then it shows the whole city filled with trash. And Mm -hmm. I guess it's the same thing with toxins in the air. And, and in anything else that we're doing that uh, is not being a good steward of, of this place we call Earth. Dr. Doug Inkley is on the phone. He's got a list of credentials that will impress everybody. He's a certified wildlife biologist. He's the senior scientist for the National Wildlife Federation. He's a lead author of the Swimming Upstream Report and contributed to CNN, the PBS NewsHour, something called Fresh Air on NPR. And we're going to talk about the freshwater fish and uh, freshwater in general uh, right now. So let's uh, say good morning and welcome Dr. Doug Inkley to the air. Good morning, doctor. Well, thank you. Hello, Larry and Robin. Hello. Thank you for being on the air with us. Where are you? I am currently in Northern Virginia. Oh, okay, okay. Virginia is a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. We have a lot of good fishing up here too on the Potomac and Shenandoah rivers. Oh, are you, are you a fisherman? I am. It, I do a fly fishing when I can, but I have to admit I'm not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a talent. Yeah, I, I'm not a fisherman. It is. I've gone fishing, but if I said I was a fisherman, I'd be lying. I, I, I've taken the boy, one of my kids were little, I used to take them out, and um, basically we would just put, you know, shrimp on hooks and throw them out there. <laughs> and I guess if we caught something, we were fishermen. Yeah. Well, I think I have to develop the proper method of uh, fly fishing. It, yep. it is tough, just like you said. Yeah, yeah. So what are, how are we doing? Uh, and maybe if we could talk about America specifically and then talk about the world are we are we falling behind are we the leader as far as, far as being good stewards of our natural resources well you know in the united states we have always uh, led the charge whether it's been uh, on conservation or many other issues you know america likes to be first uh, who wants to be second and right. we really right. have been uh, good uh, in, in leading around the nation so with conservation of the environment, uh, you know, it goes all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt uh, at the turn of the beginning of the 19th, excuse me, beginning of the 20th century, and he was extremely important. He established uh, the first uh, National Wildlife Refuge, which was the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge right there in Florida, and he established a, a good precedent, and that was we need to conserve our natural resources. After that, he went on to establish many more national wildlife refuges, five national parks, and over 100 national forests. Isn't that wow, amazing? that Isn't is that amazing? amazing. I went to his he house one vision. time. I went uh-huh. to Teddy Roosevelt's house. He has a muse- oh, his wow. house is now a museum. He killed a lot of animals. 
<laughs> well, he did kill a lot of animals, but you know, he once uh, refused to uh, shoot a cub bear, and uh, uh, industry guy or, or a merchant said, "Well, geez," and he he uh, started selling these uh, bears and named them Teddy Bear after Teddy Roosevelt, and the rest <laughs> is history. That is amazing. I, I, I remember that story, but I, I would have forgotten it. Um, so, so we as America, we're doing pretty good. Um, can we do better? We can do better. Uh, you know, we are the leading polluters in terms of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we now know that carbon dioxide actually is a pollutant, uh, it's just not a byproduct of burning our fossil fuels. It is what is driving climate change. So that is having an impact worldwide. And the United States leads to, needs to lead the way on this to address this issue, reduce our carbon emissions, and convert more to uh, natural energy sources or those which uh, uh, are things like wind and solar power. So we're not putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And do you also attribute uh, this uh, changes in the species of fish in the freshwater to the water bottling plants coming in and just draining extreme amounts of water out of there without ha- well, that that is replenishing? An issue. Uh-huh. Yes, that is very important because with with climate change, we're seeing more extreme droughts, and that puts a lot of stress on fish. So if we don't manage our water resources correctly and we drain too much water for human uses, uh, that is a real problem. And indeed, you know, the droughts that uh, were severe in the southeast several years ago uh, were drawing down reservoirs like you were talking about, and uh, it can dry up a reservoir and make it uh, obviously without any fish, and that's a problem. Do you know, you know what really? Really drove this community nuts uh, for a while there, and it was a very there was a divide in a way because some, there were some some people who denied it, and I don't know, I'm not a scientist, maybe you can actually shed light on it, and it was the the fact that we do have, as Robin mentioned, a lot of bottling plants pulling water out of the aquifer. And the, the reports you see from those who are in support of that say that's less than 1% of 1%, and it's still only 1% of what the average uh, the, the population of the whole area pulls up. So they make it seem like it's minuscule. And then they say, you've got to conserve water. The aquifer is getting low. Right. And it's like, well, wait a minute. And, th- and then they say, well, we're going to put a meter on your well yeah. so that we can charge you for water just to kind of give you, give us a way to make sure that you don't keep pulling water. So well, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. If, we, if we've got enough water to allow these bottling plants, then why are you telling us we've got to be careful with, with our water? Exactly. So it's almost like you get two messages, and, and doing a talk show, let me, let me tell you, we get, we get the message from the public that they're angry, they're confused. You have one side saying, no, there's nothing wrong with pumping water out, another side saying it, there's a lot wrong with it. So it's, it's one of those issues where, I mean, all I have at my disposal is a microphone. I can't tell you anything about the aquifer. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that is indeed a problem. If you go into the Midwest, uh, the Ogala Reservoir, the aquifer, is huge uh, throughout the Great Plains. And unfortunately for agriculture, we are using it up much faster than it is being replenished. And with climate change, we're looking at warmer temperatures and longer seasons, and that provides potential for even greater uh, pulling out of water from the aquifer. But you know, in Florida, uh, the situation there is unique in that you really have a challenge from sea level rise, which of course is being accelerated by climate change. And you know how vulnerable uh, Florida is to stronger hurricanes, which are occurring with climate change and sea level rise. There's another thing uh, affecting our clean water and your, your drinking water, and that is, are you familiar with saltwater intrusion? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, mm-hmm. that was one of the problems that we were talking about uh, regarding the lowering of the aquifer, is that the salt water would start rising into it. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right, and that ruins the aquifer. Sure. Uh, once you get salt water in there, uh, it's no longer a viable source and won't be. Yeah. One, one of the questions I have, it's kind of a little aside uh, question, but um, when we talk about large amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, and then I remember years ago we were hearing reports about uh, like the, the rainforest being depleted like like an acre every second or something huge like that, or maybe even bigger than that. If, if, the, if trees are the thing that takes... Now, I'm not a scientist, so cr- uh, you'll correct me when I'm done, I guess. But, I mean, if trees take carbon dioxide and return it to becoming oxygen, if, if they do the opposite of what animals do, then wouldn't part of the problem be because we're, de- we're cutting down so many tr- rainforests? 
That's exactly right. Uh, we're, we have a double whammy here. One thing is, is we're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and the second thing is we're reducing the ability of our natural ecosystems to take it out of the atmosphere. One of the things that we can do to address carbon dioxide pollution is to restore these natural habitats, whether in the tropics or in the uh, United States. We can put more vegetation back onto the landscape where it's been stripped off. That not only reduces carbon dioxide because of the growth of these plants, but it also provides a habitat for fish and wildlife. And, and this this must require large um, groups to do this. I, maybe I could do something in my own yard, and maybe that's part of this, is that we all as individuals have to do something so that our tiny little micro world um, adds up to lots of little micro worlds and makes a difference. But I'm guessing bigger than that, we have to have the governments jumping on board this and and how that's that's got to be yeah. hard. I mean, it's it's one thing to tell the United States government that's hard enough. Mm-hmm. But how do you tell China? How do you tell the other countries what to do? Exactly. Well, that's, again, where we need to lead the way. Why should we let China lead the way? You know, they've really been developing uh, new technologies for harnessing wind power. Why are they the lead? The United States should be the lead on that. What is the, what is the resistance need- to that? I don't, see, that's the one thing I've often thought that makes sense, but you have some people who don't want it. What is the other argument? What are they saying, those people who oppose the idea of wind Well, I think that what's happening with Congress is a lot of the uh, traditional uh, fuel sources, such as carbon, oil, and and gas, that they have very strong lobbies working for them, and they have a big influence on Congress. And to date, after years and years of trying, Congress has not taken action to reduce carbon emissions, to put a cap on carbon emissions. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court, on the other hand, has ruled that the Clean Water Act, excuse me, the Clean Air Act, can be used to regulate carbon emissions. Now we just got the got to get the administration to implement rules to do that. That hasn't been done yet. It's been proposed. It needs to be done. But now some members of Congress want to introduce a bill that says, oh, you can't do that with the Clean Air Act. Mm. And water is the breathing force of every animal and every plant on the face of this planet. Once the water starts um, disappearing and then the fish start disappearing, that affects the food chain because then it uh, affects the uh, land animals that depend on eating the fish and drinking the water. It affects the humans that depend on eating the land animals and so on and so forth. So how can we keep the other species from going into extinction uh, if we don't uh, prevent all of this horrendous uh, misuse of the water system. Well, this is exactly why we need to address the issue of climate change. Uh, the changes to the climate um, caused by carbon uh, include bigger droughts and actually include bigger floods as well. But these extremities cause tremendous problems. And you're right. What we need to do is preserve the entire ecosystem from the bottom of the food chain to the top of the food chain. Is 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 that a problem also in the upper states? I'm from Wisconsin, and ice fishing was very big up there in in Minnesota and in Canada and when you know you have the change of the seasons and you've got all that ice is the ice decreasing also Oh, absolutely. There have been scientific studies that have shown over the past two or three decades that the ice, the amount of ice that occurs on the lakes is dramatically decreasing. Uh, It is forming later in the winter, and it is melting out uh, earlier in the spring. So that is indeed changing the ecology of these lakes, and the scientists in Minnesota and Wisconsin are very concerned about that. It just makes a fundamental change uh, to those ecosystems. And another way to look at this is that in Minnesota, they've just closed the moose season probably forever. Oh. High heat is probably distressing or actually is distressing these moose, making them more vulnerable to other things like disease. And one of their two populations is already gone. And the other population has dramatically declined in the past several years, and so they finally closed hunting this year. Oh, my. Oh, wow. Uh, Our guest is Dr. Doug Inkley. He's a certified wildlife biologist. We're talking about the the natural environment of all of us, the Mm -hmm. the animals as well as us. We started talking about fish. I want to go back to fish just for a moment here. Uh, I also brought up the the Silver River and Silver Springs, and I just, I don't know if you know what Silver Springs is, but at one time it was the, the thing to come to in Florida before 
Disney. Uh, they had the glass bottom boats, and you would, and people would come down here. But they would flock down here, and you would go into those boats, look through the glass, and see huge numbers of fish. The, the pilot of the boat, the captain, would throw some bread in, and then yeah. just unbelievably large numbers of these beautiful fish would be under the boat. And it was just you know a way to spend your summer vacation or whatever. And and now it's still there. They still have it's still a beautiful river. But the one thing that is different, and this really is from people who've lived here longer than me, but I do remember that actually. So I've been here long enough to remember that the fish, the number of fish, are clearly yeah. the smaller. The, the, you hardly see any fish. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, now the, part two to what I'm trying to tell you, and that'll lead to my question, is part two is that the state of Florida recently. Um, I guess allocated some money so that we could start doing things that would clean up the the reason that they believe the fish are in decline, which is the runoff from the fertilizers, et, mm-hmm. et cetera. So in our little area, it seems like we're doing something you know, as a community to fix that one little river. Um, is it possible that we could actually affect the whole world if every little community would do something similar? Or am I too optimistic? Well, I don't think you're too optimistic. It is a challenge for people around the world to do that. But that is exactly what needs to be done, because it's not just climate change. It is indeed, as you mentioned, uh, it is fertilizers that are enriching the waters. Uh, It is water pollution. It is water uh, withdrawal that's too high. And when you put all these together, uh, the impacts may be uh, quite a bit larger than if you considered the impacts uh, individually. And you know, you mentioned that the, the people have gone out in these boats to look at the fish. That's important in Florida economically when you consider all the other factors. Oh, yeah. You know that, yeah, in Florida, they, Florida is in the top 10 for the number of freshwater anglers. There's more than 1 million freshwater anglers in the state, and they spend more than $700 million a year to pursue their fishing activities wow. in freshwater. So it's important in Florida, and it's important throughout the United States. It's just fun, too, right? It's fun. <laughs> Can the desalinization plants help the problem also? Well, desalinization is an expensive uh, process, and it's just not a good way to, uh, to restore and to provide fresh water. What we need to do is protect that fresh water, first of all, in the place that it is. Desalinization is is not a viable technique for providing fresh water for natural ecosystems, although in some situations it does provide drinking water for humans, of course. And there are some species that are that live in the salt water, but every once in a while, like the manatees, you'll see them come up into the freshwater rivers rivers around here. Does that hurt? Well, it does hurt to some extent because uh, as the rivers and the waters are changing, uh, we're seeing that some of the seagrasses and and other uh, vegetation that uh, manatees are dependent upon uh, can be disappearing, especially as there are changes in the salinity of the water. Um, I've seen some of this. I've seen manatees in Florida. I used to work for what was then called the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. Oh, yeah. And these changes are all a big concern. Doctor, I want to ask you something about the radio tour you're doing because I know talk radio. I've been doing it a very long time and I know the talking points and I know that global warming is one of those button pushing talking points. And I also know the comeback. The comeback that you you probably get from a lot of talk show hosts is the challenge to prove that the global warming is indeed being caused by us and not a natural thing that's happening. So, and I'm not challenging you, but I just know the talking points, and I'm guessing you're running into it with some of the shows you're probably calling. What What is your response to that when you get that? Well, I do hear that. Um, however, the number of times that I hear that is declining over the years. And those people that don't understand uh, climate change and believe in it, we're going to leave them behind. We have scientists from around the world that have documented climate change. It is about long-term trends. Uh, we're seeing it. It is positive, it, or it's actually a negative issue, but there's no question that it is there. As a scientist, I have no doubt whatsoever. So we do need to address this issue. And and th- th- those people that don't believe it, they're becoming insignificant to the issue. Well, and Not I didn't mean significant to... enough, but... Okay, and I just to clarify, I didn't mean that they didn't believe it. A lot of a lot of talk show hosts believe it. They just don't believe that we're responsible for it. They think it's natural. It's happening because the sun is 
more flares or there's things going on in, in the ga- in the uh, solar system. Mm-hmm. No, that's not it. People like to come up with all sorts of theories. But, you know, uh, in Hawaii, there's a famous uh, scientific station where they've been monitoring the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for decades. And they have seen it increase by more than a third. There's no question that there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And when you look and you total up the amount of carbon and, uh, that we're putting into the atmosphere through coal and oil and gas, uh, that's where it's coming from. You, you can't deny it. That is where it is coming from. Well, and I've always said this, that I'm not a scientist, but if I fly into a big city, L.A. is a good example, mm-hmm. you can see through the window of the airplane, you can see like this dome of, of dirt, like a dome of smog. And, wow. And you can, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I can't see it in New York, I guess, because it's too spread out or something. Mm-hmm. But, it, but it must the same thing must be happening there. Um, well, I, you know, I've always felt like we need to be good stewards, and me as a as an individual, I suppose I can do my part um, mm-hmm. in you know, many different ways. Um, well, it takes the sum of all of us. You yeah. know, no individual acting alone will make a, a big difference, but if you act, uh, if Robin acts, if all of your listeners act, if I act, we got to get everybody in the United States to be addressing this issue, and then. We will make a difference. Now, there is a report associated with this interview, so is there a way to get it? It's the Swimming Upstream Freshwater Fish in a Warming World report. Yes, there is a very easy way for people to get this report on freshwater fish and climate. All they need to do is go to nwf.org, that's nwf, like National Wildlife Federation, dot org, slash Fish and climate, all one word, fish and climate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is probably a dumb question, but does this climate change affect the aridness of the deserts? Oh, absolutely it does. Uh, One of the things that is projected is that the southwestern portion of the country is likely to become uh, drier. They might actually have more precipitation in some areas, but with the much warmer temperatures, uh, it evaporates uh, more quickly and is used by the plants more quickly. There has been severe drought uh, in the southwestern United States in uh, the past uh, five, ten years, and wildlife and fish are feeling the impact. This is a fascinating, fascinating study that you have spearheaded, sir. It is amazing. Uh, Just real quickly, just to reintroduce Dr. Doug Inkley, we have to say goodbye now, but I wanted to make sure we got the website. It's nwf.org, as in National Wildlife Federation, right? The F is Federation? Yes. Nationalwildlifefederation.org, nwf.org. Doctor, thank you for being on the air with us, and um, have a great autumn. Well, thank you, and we appreciate your concern about this global climate change issue. It affects all of us. It affects all our fish and wildlife, and we can address it. And we live here, too, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, doctor. Good interview. We will take a little break. We'll be right back. We're listening to WOCA News Talk 1370, Ocala's source for what's happening in today's hottest up-to-date news and topics. World War II veterans, the world's only full dual control P-51C Mustang fighter, B-17 Flying Fortress, and the B-24 Liberator Heavy Bombers are coming to Ocala International Airport November 8th to the 10th for an amazing World War II living history event. Explore these beautifully restored World War II aircraft inside and out and even become a part of the crew in an unforgettable flight experience. Or get some stick time in the legendary Mustang. For more information, dates, and flight reservations, call 800-568-8924 or see our website at bomberrides.org. 